time. So, John, it's yours. Hello. As with last week, uh, if there are maintainers on the call, I see Derek. Uh, I would be interested in feedback on this data PR. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. And then uh, I have had folks reach out to me about like, can we use Helm with this experimental OCI thing? Is it OK? Um, and like from my perspective, as a registry operator, Helm is using the registry API in an acceptable way that I think is fine. Uh, but I think customers are wary to use something that is marked as experimental explicitly. And when I went digging into this, I found like this thread where Bacon Gobbler said they would like something to be blessed by OCI. Uh, I don't know if like they're already in contact with someone or like who's part of those decisions, but I would be interested in talking to people who think they need my blessing to do something because like if it's blocking customers from doing what they want, then that seems unnecessary. So I don't know if anyone is like part of the Helm community who is also here or knows who I could talk to you about that, or maybe we should invite someone. I bet the, I could say I've been at kind of the heart of this debate and conversation. It goes right back to is artifacts a spec and what exactly is this thing? Because Honestly, we've get responses from various maintainers and TOB members that have not stated that it is a, a real thing or not. And with you know, Josh kind of covered this in his podcast a while ago. So they're kind of caught in this spot where they're trying to look for what is a, a, um, a compliant answer to this. Uh, the and it's tied up in a couple of things because we get this in ACR as well. Is this a okay? This is a Helm Helm. I thought that for a second I was wondering if you were pointing to a GCR question. We get this from Azure customers all the time. Does Azure support this thing? You know, the thing says experimental. It's like okay, the experimental flag is on the Helm CLI. It's not a Azure CLI. We don't. We've actually been trying to deprecate our Azure specific CLI around Helm because we created this standard, so it didn't have to be unique to Azure. Um, there is active work to get the experimental flag removed. Um, I'm noticing this is commented on June. I'd have to read this. It actually references the HIP-6 uh, proposal. So I believe, because Josh is uh, out um, taking some time. So when I pinged him last before my vacation, he was still actively closing down the issues to meet HIP-6. Um, I see that these are, well, this is back in July, so I'd have to read this more. But I think this, the thing that this body could do is certainly the TOB and maintainers is say that, yes, we do endorse this usage of registries and not be giving ambiguity back on those questions. Yeah, I mean, I've found docs from us and Microsoft and Amazon of like how to use this experimental feature. And so that seems like an implicit endorsement that like, yes, we think it is fine to, to do this. Um, if they, I mean, I know there's probably technical work to be done, but this seventh point in HIP six is like, they want an official blessing of some kind. I, I would say like by the power vested in me, uh, you have my blessing to do this, but Obviously, like if you rewrite everything and how everything works to fundamentally change how you're interacting with the registry, that that changes things. But as far as I know, how this works seems fine. Uh, if anyone is watching this recording from the Helm community, please talk to me. Sorry, I'm trying to find the question. I can't remember where it was. It was on artifacts as an issue or something that basically was declared a, a, a release. A oh, release, please. Here it is, right here. Actually, I just found it. Um, I'll, I'll paste it in the in the zone. Uh, whatever this thing is, Zoom, and then I'll paste it in the uh, hack doc as well. But that's that has been the source of the debate. I, I'm not saying I agree with the debate. I'm just saying, and, and I think when the distribution spec doc became a one-off release, there was a lot of great work done to refer to things as artifacts, not just images. Images was one of the many artifacts. 
I, I was surprised to see this still being a question, honestly. Yeah, I guess I don't really understand what it means to release like a bunch of markdown. Um, I guess that's what our specs are as well. Uh, but there's also like code in the specs, you know, like there's some Go structs that you may want to use. So I don't know. I like, I would say that given the 1.0 of distribution and image spec, the artifact stuff is a composition of those two released things. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell them. I don't think it makes sense to release this because this is like a strategy for using the other things that have releases. But uh, maybe we can invite uh, who filed this, Matt. Yeah. Uh, you know, hopefully the you know the stuff we're doing with the artifact spec ultimately does solve that, and we could converge the two together. But that's I don't know if that's the the bigger hammer that has to be done here. It was posted in July. That's when Josh was still finishing up some work. They're on that, so I don't know. I, this, I mean, this showed up what five minutes before the the call, so I'd have to read more about this latest rant on. It's a circular dependency problem. They don't want to depend on anything in OCI until it's released, and and then the release stuff says, well, we can't really adopt it until there's usage. And there's plenty of Helm usage here, so I'm not quite sure what what else is needed. Are there registries that don't support what Helm is doing today in terms of like media type filters, stuff like that? Zhao did, uh, this actually came up on the Buildex conversation because um, there was a debate of can you, how many registries support index that has blobs in the manifest collection versus the, the artifacts um, approach the way you store, change the config media type. And I think, the hub is still has a too much of a restriction, which Justin says they're still working on finishing that up. And I can't remember the other one. Does anybody remember where that issue was that Buildex was captured with Joe had the listing? Um, I know Quay doesn't support it. Right. But you were working on that. That's what it was like you were working on finishing it, right? Or something. You had some other priority issue. Um, I mean, working is a little ambitious to describe that, but uh, we're uh, aware of the issue and it's, you know, working through the process. Does anybody remember where that link was? Because Zhao had a, a really a great listing. He basically tested it at almost every registry that I've at least ever heard of and kind of had a, a, a red or green link on it. It was probably either in distribution, distribution, or over in the build X is my guess. Isn't that the conformance stuff? Sorry, Vanessa, what was that? I think that's in the, the, the conformance repo where they have that big list of registries with the, I'll look for it now. It's not in the conformance. The conformance, we were talking about adding artifacts to conformance, but it wasn't there. He, he was in an issue related to build X. Shoot. Is it here? I'm just traversing a link that I found that does not actually have it. I got it all posted for you. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, so it's Red Hat Quay and Hub. And then, yeah, there was in, including even JFrog. Yeah, this uh, covers, this? this was looking at the blobs. Do we also, do we have something else in here that was looking at the media types? I thought he tested the layer media types and the config media types, but I'm doing that from memory, not from 
because I'd given, I, I'd written might be the, a, a conformance. Might be the second picture there, the manifest payload, which says Quay and Docker Hub don't. Yeah. But it was in the ORAS client. I wrote a quick thing. There's a PR for how you can use the ORAS client to test does a registry support flexibility. And uh, there was a great suggestion to turn it into a script, but I haven't finished that yet. And I think that's what this was trying to do. So look, it just it comes back to what we talked about before, like it, not having something as a release spec as minimal as whatever that means um, has caused ambiguity from various different channels. The question you're actually raising around Go modules in, and I think I saw Michael here, yeah, um, IBM Michael Brown. Well, all right, that, that's a pivot, so I want to be, I think it's a good question. I actually have a, I want to I, tease up a separate item for should we put language specific code into a spec because um, we're having that exact conversation with artifacts and I, the conversation I had with Michael here was there was a versioning problem that made that difficult for us to make changes and Michael maybe remember what the details were but I, before I tangent that's that was uh I don't know what people want to do like if if we wanted to put a vote and put a nod into that issue that I put there on the one that Mike, uh, Matt Farina opened, like what else do you want? I'm missing which we pivot to. Sorry, I'm going back to the one that John originally asked about because we started going down uh, right. a rabbit hole. Back to 26. Uh, it's the artifacts uh, 23 release, please. So John, if you want to comment on there that the use as specified is, you know, consistent with the released specs, then maybe we can just close this one. All right. I mean, so it seems like somebody brought this up before me that distribution spec is 1.0. This was pre-distribution 1.0. On the uh, 9188 on Helm Helm, there's like a conversation about well, distribution spec is 1.0, and then they say it's unclear whether OCI artifact is 1.0. Then the other thing came that you linked to. Okay, I'll comment somewhere. I I think it's fine to do this the way they're doing it. So I if they're blocked on us, I think we should unblock them. But I. I'd like to understand more about why they want to be blocked on us. I, I, I can't disagree more or can't agree more with why there's a, a, a chicken egg problem or cart horse. Yeah, that's, okay. that's all I want to really talk about. And I mean, if anyone who's listening knows someone who can talk to me again, have them show up to these meetings or something. That would be great. Uh, I can reach out to them. Um, but I, while we're on the topic, it, I, I am curious because I was literally about to respond to an issue on this. What now that we've shipped things this way, where the distribution and image specs that are supposed to be marked down, as you said, do have Go modules in them, which makes it interesting, the Windows image issue that we had a couple of months ago, a month or two ago, I've lost track of time, where there was a case changing of the letter S that wasn't caught by somebody because they had to re-implement um, the, the API and the interface in the .NET library. They just missed it, right? Just humans are part of the process. Um, it'd be nice maybe if there was multiple languages that implement the various specs Right now, we have languages in a particular spec. And, and Michael, again, I forgot what it was. When we wanted to release a new version of um, 
see my subject all over the place, so I'll just shut that off because it's just weird. I, the, the new version is how do we resolve the Go modules in a released version way? I'm not even sure if I'm saying this right. I see, I see, I see your question, yeah. Uh, generally, you would you would have to add a tag. You can do a go sub module. Um, yeah, it's it's it, it wouldn't be easy uh, or impossible. I'm not sure if I'm helping you. <laughs> well, so I, sorry, I was laughing at Brandon's <laughs> deep fake up <comment. laughs> because it was an Nvidia driver. Now I'm wondering. Yeah. If that's, anyway, the. Um, as we release a new version of distribution, as we release a new version of artifacts, as we release a new version of image, whatever they may be. Yeah, they're, they're usually, them? so if they, if they have code, they're usually associated with, you know, the, the subdirectory where, where we keep the, you know, the helpers um, that get imported by the, the various clients. Um, if you were to go look in, in the container runtimes, run C, et cetera, you're, you're going to find uses of the, the of the image spec, okay, helpers that are, that are there, um, as well as the runtime spec for things like hooks and, and other stuff uh, inside of Run C. So there's a version go where there's a constant, I see, and then there's a folder for V1. Yeah. So if there was a V2 or a V1.1, we would have a version way to do the, the go modules. By path, yeah. Which is a little ugly for Go, um, because because we don't have support for generics yet in Go. Um, so if you're going to add another version, they would literally have to change their imports. So the question um, as a practice, what I guess I'm trying to ask is, should we leave, like for instance. Um, and we did this with ORAS recently, where there's ORAS-GO, there's ORAS-PI, uh, ORAS-RUST, I think there was, somebody was wanting to start on that. So you said those were su additional sub-projects? Well, they basically become projects that are implementations of the spec, but the spec itself That's would fine. be in its own repo, which is language agnostic. And right. then there's language-specific libraries that become the use, the, 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 uh, the language-specific libraries for that version of the spec. Right. That, that, that would be fine. Yeah. Would we have done the same thing with distribution and image spec? And what should we do with the artifact spec? Like, should there be an artifact spec dash go separate repo that gets released in version in sync with, you know, the spec that's language agnostic? What is the experience of this team that we've been shipping this for a couple of years? We, we've typically just stuck to go. Um, for for you know obvious reasons, right? All the code for Run C, uh, Mobi, the distribution distribution is all written in Go. Um, so we so we just did it that way um, to to help with those implementations. And then right, I've seen the lots of copies of for you know yeah. programming languages like Rust um, that are using you know using the same stuff and doing the same kind of implementations. Uh, even C run has some libraries. Um, so you know, people are trying to maintain this kind of stuff and hopefully in some of the, uh, you know, more convenient, uh, you know, root group uh, repositories like containers. Um, but yeah, we don't always do it inside of open containers. Uh, we just haven't had the time to, to support. We've had a lot of requests for it, it but we haven't, had a lot of you know maintainers want to come on board uh, to main, to keep up with those other languages, and then we talked about language agnostic kind of implementations, and, you know, with generators, and, and we just didn't go very far with that yet. Yeah, I mean, I could see us shipping maybe just an artifact spec go, you know, might be at first, um, but at least it's in a separate repo. So if somebody does want to take the time and do a Python version that they could donate it there, and then it iterates. The same thing, you know, with distribution. If you, if you do one language in GitHub, they'd like you to pick uh, which one. And that's usually why you end up with one repo per language. Is just yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I'm saying. Is um, there somebody uh, like beating down the door to 
to donate a Python version? Is there someone, is this a, an actual problem or a hypothetical problem? No, it's been an actual problem. If you look at uh, Aura's project, um, we have we have a couple of them. The Rust one didn't got dropped because somebody went to working on something else, but there is a Python version of it. Um, that's the one. I think I'm working on that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. There was like, also I think the person Reggie. was on here, but I wanted to be I sure. I was like, that. yeah, I think that's me. So the, there was also the Reggie client, which I implemented in Python. I, I guess I'm sort of the, the weirdo developer out there that's like excited to do these things. So I, if you ask if it's like a real thing, I would I would say yes. <laughs> Sorry, no. Yeah, it's, no. it's the long term. It's the long term issue that, that becomes the and how do we go fix everybody and the, do the maintainers stick around? That that's usually how do we, how do we yeah. set it up so we can do this kind of thing? That's what I'm more asking. I'm not suggesting we do yeah. implement 12 different languages. What I'm saying is, should we factor the languages out so that the specs are the specs, they get released, the libraries get updated when they should be updated, whether we decide that they have to be updated to release a spec is an interesting question. Right. So if we're worried about long-term maintainer availability, would it make sense to have it as like a contribution repo? Like this is not something we're maintaining, but this is contributed by the community. And that way we don't make a claim that we're providing something that we're maintaining, but it's at least available there. People want to start putting stuff up there. They, you mean non-OCI or some just point to some other Hopefully still under OCI, but just with a big banner. And like, you wouldn't put a big experimental banner, just like this is a community contributed repo versus something that OCI is providing and providing a search for. Go ahead, Nisha. You're so, yeah, um, I wonder um, who who is consuming the Python version of Auras? Yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of comment on that. Um, so. One of the things that I would like to improve upon in at least like the HPC community is just our interaction, not just with OCI, but just with the whole, e the whole ecosystem. And if you look at languages that we tend to use on HPC, there are, you know, compiled ones. So C++, um, not very much like Rust or Go, but, you know, kind of the old school languages like Fortran that you see in these really old codes. But then when it comes to actually research, most researchers are using like Python, small subset of RR or maybe Julia. And so the reason to do things in Python is really to bring in that entire community. I think there's so many tools here that uh, people in the HPC or scientific, you know, academic ecos community don't, don't even give a second look at because like just Go isn't in their tool belt of things. So if anything, it, I think it's worth a try to create all these things in, in Python and then, you know, hand them to that community and be like, hey, look at this. This is something that could be useful to you. What do you think? What can you do with it? And, you know, the worst case, like, no one cares, but that's kind of always the worst case. So I would, I'm a strong advocate for, you know, doing things in Python if, if there's someone that's willing to do it. Yeah, so um, incidentally, uh, the churn community has been thinking about rewriting some of most of our code in Go um, because the community that we work with is, um, uh, it, it mostly programs in Go, and they are reluctant to adopt um, Turn because it's written in Python. So we have the opposite problem. Um, but I was wondering if it's possible to write uh, Python bindings for uh, the Go library. So if, if there's a reference library for the spec written in Go, can there be like uh, Python bindings for those? Uh, because that's what we were planning to do with turn. So not get rid of the original turn project, but convert it into like a, a Python API that uses the Go uh, backend. So we, we, we don't have a whole lot of, um you know, code, uh, mostly it's just J J JSON serializers, deserializers, you know, getters and setters, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Um, unless you want to consider it, run C. <laughs> right. incid it, yeah, incident. Also, incidentally, the SPDX community has also been speaking about how do we maintain all these implementations uh, in various different languages. SPDX has implementations in Java, Python, and Go, and they're all in different stages of development. Um, I miss Java. <laughs> you're the only one that has told me that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, it. this is because that's how like the progression of technology has gone, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, Java was the hotness and now Go is the hotness. Uh, but there are still people that are using Java and so they don't want to miss out. And, and JavaScript, you know, quite oh, uh, yeah. one, or, one or two people still using that. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> and, and that's the other thing, like different uh, communities use choose different languages and it's like, Okay. And, and I, usually I in the wanna... container world, it's just, it's the implementation detail. Most of the users of it are, are inside the container and they can, they can use any programming language they want. And we usually don't try to encourage them, you know, to be, to be managers of that which they came from, right? But, you know, that is, that is one of the things that I'm wondering about because considering that you know, we now live in this cont containerized world and there is no more portability issue or, and uh, dependency issue. People still want to, you know, work, use the thing that everyone else uses. I mean, there's still like some homogeneity in the connections. So uh, yeah, so, I don't know. It's like, brings me to a question. I don't know if Nisha or Vanessa or both, um, but what are people today using like the Python bindings, stuff like that to talk to a registry for, because that is like Mike was saying, usually the, the data scientists are doing the data coding inside of the containers. They don't really care about the registry at that point. So I'm curious about the use cases. I think on my side, the use case is more sort of what a research software engineer would do. So if you think of the, like a couple of three different groups, they're sort of like the Linux, Linux and the system administrators. They're the ones arguably that are like, you know, installing so, all installing software where they, they use modules or they use some kind of package managers, that's sort of their thing. They may make containers available. Then there, of course, are the researchers on the other side that are doing everything sort of in those languages. But in the middle of that are sort of like the research software engineers or the RSEs. And they're figuring out like, okay, I have this, you know, scientific code on my right, it's in Python, and I need a way to communicate with some infrastructure that's available or whatever on the HPC or cloud or something, I need to write some like binding between that. So I think, I don't, I don't see, I, I think I agree, I don't see like the, the person writing like the physics simulations to be thinking a lot about like, you know, registries or container runtimes. But I think the people that are trying to make everything work together are going to be interested in those kinds of tools that kind of connect these disparate things. Yeah, and it might be, oh, oh, I'm going to finish this point up now, I'll turn it over to you, Steve. But it might be that, you know, if we provide some of the tooling and we get it working nicely and go that it's just an executable, then that binding might just be shell out and call the executable we provide to do it. And so they can still do their stuff in Python. And we just got the tools over and go that we're maintaining for them. You'll find most of our popular clients have a Go client or in a gRPC client, and you can just hook it up that way. Yeah. And gRPC, of course, will generate a service binding for any language you want. You know, yeah. So, sorry, yeah, Steve, I think go there's, ahead. I think there's probably cultural boundaries too. So, for one, one very easy example is look at Singularity. It used to be in. Um, C and Python and Bash and those converted to Go. And just the install process, it used to be uh, uh, in auto con configure and then uh, installing with Go. A lot of Linux admins were very, very ordinary about that. <laughs> um, so it's sort of just a, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's so many cultural factors. I don't, I think that's part of the problem too. Yeah, yeah. And, and I get, and you could say the same thing going to Python. Which Python? Did you mean two? Python two or? Or one, or yeah, it's, it's the same problem. Yeah, and all that's the way it seems from the other side. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo with what Vanessa said from, from Sandia's side too, from the labs here with the, uh, is it the ops side? Or is it the scientist side? You know, bridging the gap right now in some of my current work with DevOps, MLOps, and the data scientists, you know, trying to draw that line of, you know, this is conversations I have with Dimitri and them in the MLOps community too, where my de- some of my data scientists do not want to go deep. They don't have to worry about the configuration of the, the containers. They literally just want their environments that they, they need. Conversely, I have other colleagues that are, you know, helping support some of that with me and they do want to get deep in there and we want to adjust it. So um, it's, it's difficult to say the least. And then the, the other detail to add on to that is like, let's say that you are using something that happens to be in Go and there's some nasty error that prints the console. If you're, let's say you're an RSC or you're a scientist and you're, there are languages that you're comfortable with and there's a degree to which you'll feel empowered to like go to the source code, figure out what's going on and then, you know, open a PR an issue and like help fix it versus just being like, oh, well, this is in Go. I'm just going to like not use this anymore so that's I, I think just increasing the contributions but i think as probably someone listening to this right now would point out uh as, as soon as you choose one language over the other you know then you lose the other group that was more familiar with the, the first language so it's, it's a double-sided coin yep i mean i just wonder like it, there's lots of, we see lots of different language implementations of the various toolings and they're in random places and nobody ever wants to contribute to the next one um, it's not mine. Where if there is, if they were in the body that owns the spec, let's say, wherever the right foundation is, depending on the thing, you know, if you know Fred wants to make changes, not willing to build it up himself, but he sees something. And to Vanessa's point, if there is an error that changed because we changed something, or we clarify something, or it just wasn't right in the first place, like a capital S, then somebody else could just make that PR and fix it as opposed to having to maintain multiple branches of different things or you know, multiple repos. So I'm just wondering if, if there is language specific needs, if we at least enable the opportunity for that. And you know, ORAS is the interesting one. Like I, the Rust one got created, it was dormant. We've been asking ourselves like, hey, let's should we delete this thing? And we probably will until somebody else, and we'll probably archive it or something. And if somebody wants to revive it, great. Um, should we, like the question I kind of started off with is should there just be separate language specific repos so that you could have different maintainers that own those? The idea is that Vanessa was a maintainer on the Python repo, but she may not be on the spec, let's say, or whatever the other one was. Um, so she's now empowered to own that. If somebody else wants to contribute, they can make a PR to the, the Python you know, language. If somebody wants to make a Rust one and wants to maintain it, great. And if, if we find, in the future that's not being maintained, and then we do label it. But the, is there a value in creating a language specific repo for the spec in, alongside of it so that there is a central place for the community to contribute to? I uh, just wanna uh, talk about like the, the Python use case with regards to like working in a predominantly Go ecosystem. So we've gotten around, you know, that uh, thing, that block usually by shelling out to whatever tools are there. Uh, But what we found with the Go ecosystem is that there's a lot of functionality that isn't exposed. Uh, One example that I bring up is the the Kaneko snapshotter. So the snapshot works in user space, and that's what makes uh, it um, capable of building container images on Kubernetes. We would like to use that snapshot, but there's no tool that's built around that snapshot. It's a, like Canical just builds and deploys, and that's it. There's like nothing in the middle where we can like hook our turn fingers in and inventory things. Um, I think there are uh, some other stuff that is Kubernetes related that, you know, cannot be integrated well because uh, turn is written in Python. Um, so it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, we, we don't have a choice in this matter. And I 
and perhaps it may be the same thing on Python, although Python is way more forgivable than Go is. I, I'm trying to understand if you're trying to say that Turn should just move to Go and, and not worry about Python anymore, or it's just it would be helpful if there was two because different audiences use different tools for the reasons that they do. Like, I, I don't expect the ML community to move to Go, right? They've clearly got their feet dug into their language. I would just be happy if they stopped generated monstrous images and we could figure out how to help them do that. Um, well, I mean, uh, see, that's that's part of the problem, right? The, the monster images are coming because uh, the, the modules are so big and the, the um, generally ML folks are not interested in the system level stuff that the containers do. Um, we just happen to write a tool, a system tool in Python. Uh, and that might be because I am historically from the embedded world and the, the uh, systems like the OS installation world that usually works with C and Python for automation, uh, C for libraries, Python for automation, um, and especially with build tools. So for example, Yocto project is written in Python. Uh, so now I am realizing that I can't just keep shelling out to various tools that other people have written for you know, their own use cases. Um, but the, the Python tool can still exist as a CLI tool if anyone wants to run it. And we have people already running it in production. So we can't, we can't get rid of it. I guess part of me wants to say, hey, I'm trying to make some of these command line tools that you can shell out to that aren't so opinionated. And so maybe there are some answers there, but I think in general, the, the bigger thought I was gonna come in with was saying that maybe there's an in-between solution instead of having someone rewrite the whole spec in Rust and Python, every other language out there and, or having the data scientists convert all their stuff over to go, maybe it just makes sense to start making some little wrappers on the functionality you do need and just take a little small sliver in there and just have that interface that gets it out to a shell that then you can reach. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, like, I really liked that idea you have about like, a, you know, being able to make Python bindings from Go. I, I had kind of thought of that um, when I started working on the ORS Python and I just like didn't find anything. Is this something we can like ask Google, put in like a feature request that like to start thinking about or working on? Because it seems like it would be so useful and it's that middle ground thing that we need. The, are there not Python bindings for C? I oh, mean, there, I mean yeah, there definitely you can, are. Think. You can do it by like thunks through C, but it's really That's gnarly what I'm saying. and I yeah. would uh, advise against it having written too much C Go in a previous life. Uh, oh, that was all right. There, there goes the other, the other idea. <laughs> Okay. So if we took, sorry, I'm still trying to come back with, do we create separate repos? That if we, if we were to create the thin wrappers, would you still have those in a separate repo? Or would you try to put them in the single repo? Like, would you have the uh, distribution spec with Go, Python, Rust in the same repo? Or would you have the distribution spec be the markdown files and the language is marked down, if you will. And then there's a separate repo that says this is Go. There's a separate repo that says this is Python. Maybe the Python repo is just uh, wrappers around uh, the Go uh, output. My vision Definitely was the a second lot. one. Definitely the second one. The first one sounds like a nice second. <laughs> Say that again. Yeah. The, the easier one is to have everything in one repo, uh, but uh, it, depending upon what, uh, oh, <laughs> Vanessa saying, no way, no way. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. It, okay. It's one of those things that you get two chefs, you're going to have two opinions. 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's part yeah. of the no, problem no, no, is the no. dictators of each language versus the compiling and, of each and whether or not, yeah, 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 it's it, it, it is actually hard to have multiple languages in one in one GitHub repo. Okay, okay, so everyone's in agreement with me <laughs> multiple repos, multiple repos, I think. <laughs> Do we need Facebook and Google to weigh in here, or the, aren't they the, the mono repo monsters? <laughs> Well, it doesn't have to be a mono repo monster. I'm just joking. I'm going yeah, on this just, chat. Sorry. I was going to come back to Steve's question, though, in terms of where to put it. I don't think it makes too much sense to put it in OCI just because we don't really have a lot of implementations other than run C. You know, so there's no main that they would be dropping in to have that wrapper script in there that would make sense in their OCI. But there might be other repos that are calling OCI that have some functionality they're extending in either add more of their code to give them that extension in there or make something that is based off that in a separate repo somewhere else, just wherever it makes the most sense. Yeah, it could be that uh, there's some kind of, pro I think this is something that OCI has been kind of dealing with a long time. There's like the specs like Markdown and then there's like projects that are actual implementations. And I guess the projects that are sort of blessed by OCI belong like alongside the, the OCI specs, but for projects that, you know, might be like some version of something in Python, maybe it, I think it does make sense to have them separate. You know, they're not like official yeah. supported OCI projects, but then to maybe just within OCI have like one repo that serves more as documentation, like here's all the Python, you know, wrappers or whatever for this that we have. So if someone does make a project and they want that visibility, um, they can just get added to that list. And then it's easy also for someone to find what they're looking for. Yeah. I think we need a website for that. That that was a complete Vanessa reference there, but unfortunately we don't have the people to help you out on that right now today. I, I put a link to the, the Rust OCI spec repo in containers. I, I'm just saying that I, the way they did it might might be valid. And it might be a good place to put it. There's a lot of other OCI stuff in that, in that project. We, we, we can always bring it back in. Right? Yeah, and, and if I'm- it, If it needs the main- clear, I'm not, I'm not actually not suggesting we change anything of where things are now in OCI. There's all kinds of issues related to that. What I am trying to figure out is for the new things that we're doing, do we just follow the, if, if it is a bad convention, do we follow it because a bad convention is better than, you know, differences? Or is this something that it'd be a nice thing to clean up? And as we're doing the artifact stuff, like literally I've got a PR from Avril to check in some Go modules and I'm, I'm questioning, should it go into that repo or should we create an artifact spec dash Go? And I think by convention, happen? it's okay to pick a language and make it go for now. Um, in, until we have a better a better answer, um, you know, just just to help out that stack. And as ORAS is built on Go, maybe it just makes sense to continue that, you know, with that pattern. Um, well, but in, in ORAS, we actually did split those out. So we did keep ORAS, the repo to just be ORAS, because that's a CLI, maybe you don't care, it just happened to be written Go. But we did refactor things to have ORAS CLI, sorry, ORAS libraries, because if you look at Helm, Helm is actually using the libraries. They're not using the client, right? They use right. the libraries. We just built exactly. this ORAS client that was basically, here's this universal test client that we don't expect anybody to use in a production a production as the thing for their, their specific artifact. It's like, here's uh -huh. a file the API. But if you want to build, like, and I demoed this this morning with SPDX, it's like SPDX push, SPDX LS, you know, SPDX uh, discover. And it used... Well, it used a bunch of things. The theory is it would use the ORAS libraries and reference types um, to generate SBOMs and push them. Um, it happened to be written in Go. You know, it happened to use the Go libraries. But if somebody wants to write it in .NET, you know, they can write it in .NET or Python or or whatever. And the idea is that those are um, available. So we did we did split them out, and I think that's helped with some clarity. It's only been a month, so we'll see what people think. What's yeah. the, Vanessa, you want to riff on what you just posted? 
yeah, so I'm just a general reference. So that's how GitHub, bas basically GitHub has a RESTful API. And of course, everyone writes, you know, a client in their favorite language. And so kind of akin to what I was saying before is that there's just a page that they have on their, you know, official site that says like, here's all these tools and all these languages that you can choose from. You know, they aren't under GitHub, but they are available. And it's, it has that modularity of maintainership, yeah. which I think is so important to everything. That's interesting. So the discoverability problem is that it might not be under the orgs, that repo for that library so it may not be under the org, but there's a doc that says, here's the one that we bless, or here's a, a couple that we might bless, and, and you can go there, and at least there's, you, you know, a where community to doc. Yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah, and I actually think it's okay that, for example, OCI chooses one language to throw them all, as uh, Brandon said, and, and does go and has go alongside the repos. Um, but I think I think as long as there's a message that like it's okay to develop libraries and other languages if you want, um, and here here they are, we are going to champion them too, even though they aren't like directly alongside this GitHub organization. Yeah, the so part that's he's, bit. Sorry. I was going to ask Michael that's... Brown, ECR Michael Brown, like, you know, what do you, what's, like, what, what should we do in the R stuff? Do you have an opinion that we can, you know, maybe voice here? And I was thinking artifact spec dash go so that it's a separate one. And maybe if there is a Python, we wait for it to be, we wait for Vanessa to get further along before we put it under the org. <laughs> and then she would donate it maybe. Uh, at first, it's a, a link as a doc link, as we just said, but I don't know, what do you think? Um, I, I, I guess I don't think I have a very strong opinion other than I think the more clients you add, the harder it's going to be to support them all, uh, which I think people have said. Yeah, what's bitten me working with just in Toto lately is that they've got the Python and the Golang implementations and they're just not in sync. And so as a user of that, when you have something that has two different implementations that are following two different versions of the spec. It's just hard on users. Is it I think better to way... not have one language altogether? Like, do it's... you care that it's two or do you have your language that you care about? I, I'm, I don't know the answer I'm asking. I think I'd prefer I... to have one or zero. I'd, I'd rather have one or uh, not two. I think in some ways, though, seeing, so if you have something that's sort of agnostic, whether that's like an API or a spec, I think in some ways, seeing this desire to create libraries in different languages is actually like a, a sign or it's like a progression or that the software or the spec or whatever has reached some point where people really do want to use it. It's almost like a sign of maturity for the thing. And then, you know, the question of maintainership, like, yeah, of course, that's always going to be an issue. But if people have the desire to use it, then arguably, there's the desire for that maintainership. And then I, th I think if you look at, for example, even some of these, these GitHub uh, clients, what happens over time is they do, they kind of explode, because like, everyone's like, oh, there's not a GitHub kind, I'm going to make one, and then everyone makes one. And then it sort of whittles down to like one that is sort of better than the others that people tend to use. So it's almost like this uh, organic, like growth and then pruning process. Um, so I, I think I, I, it almost feels like it's not something we can just decide. Like it, it feels like we should, or maybe we should just be open to this idea that it could happen and we should support it, not necessarily saying that it's a good or a bad thing and just see where it goes. And sort of like I said before, the worst thing that happens is that it doesn't go anywhere. But I think, I think it would be bad not to try to embrace some kind of effort that comes sort of organically from the community, some desire to, to make clients in different languages. Especially for things that start to have more general usage, like, you know, when, when the image stuff, was, when the registry and image spec was literally just container images, there was a set of tools that, you know, Michael was kind of listing earlier. Now that we're doing it more generically, I've got every, people coming out of the woodwork with a language of choice. And like we have an entire teams, two teams at Microsoft that maintain language specific um, uh, APIs for, um, for, so that we never lose a particular community of developers in that area. So I, I agree with your sense of maturity aspect. So 
when it reaches it, I think part of the question is when is it when it reaches it, was the or were the repos structured in such a way that it doesn't look weird that there's like the just default language, whatever it might be. I don't really care this go or something. And then all the others. So um okay. I think I think it would be valid for for to use code generators and validation code for for some set of languages. Um, especially for you know serialization to serialization of, of the of our types um, for the images, for example, and then for distribution distribution. Of course, we've got an HTTP API, which would benefit tremendously if people want to write clients for any kind of artifact kind, right? In all these various languages, I think that does actually make sense. I'm in a container and I want to you know writing JavaScript and I want to pull an artifact. It makes sense, right? So, so I, I do think this is a good idea. I'm, I'm not trying to poo-poo it. It's just, it's, it's a lot of work just to set it up. And I think it would be different per, per repo um, based on how we've distributed stuff around. And then and on run C, it's obvious that, you know, we've already got many bindings for that and that would be in their, in their project, um, you know, like Seago, using C <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, but you know, similar 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 tools uh, could could be used. Um, you know, for the various projects to add additional languages, and you would just have to have a binding library that's built and tested with some kind of container-based integration tool set um, in inside the repo. Should should be doable. Make makes a lot of sense. Who who wants to do the first pull request? <laughs> we we could definitely start working on it. Just open up an issue. In your favorite repo, um, I think, Steve, and and, and well, we, I, I think it's I, I what I'm you need the use it. case and an example, and, and we can just yeah. get going on it. It's not it's not really that bad. Um, what I think I'm hearing, just to kind of put put a thought out there, is the, the issues are language specific repos. If there are multiples, there's a problem, and then the whole mono repo is the fun part of it. There's you need a set of maintainers, which is they're different maintainers because they're different passions and you want to enable them to do that. Um, then the question is, does it stay maintained? So uh, I'll use Zora as a perfect example. We've got two repos that are not active and Vanessa will talk. Um, so, you know, and the answer would be like, hey, if you want to do this, great, but let's do it in a place and get it to a stable point and then let's move it over because- Honestly, I think you'd be switching to a code generation type model. Well, that's right. the, I thought it was the last one I was going to list. I think you'd have to switch to that if you wanted to have any decent, you know, number and, and want to keep it all the same version. Um, I think you'd see if Sajay wants to poke in, like the, the concept of code generation is not as good as we think it is. And then the concept of what the output of yeah, that, that's is we're, definitely we, not the best of All the Kubernetes APIs and all the CRI stuff, everything is living on it. Yeah. Maybe they're easier to, to consume. All the gRPC stuff. Yeah, it's this is so it, okay. it would be an interesting discussion. Matter of fact, I think this is the kind of discussion that should happen at KubeCon. But um, with, with a lot more people involved, right? That are that are experts in this field. Cool. Maybe maybe they they'd be the best ones to volunteer some. I, I've written a lot of code generators. It's not fun. <laughs> But if somebody's already got one that we could use, we'll just write some YAML and, and we're good to go, right? <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling and laughing, but this is this is doable. It's just, it's you're not going to get it from from go to everybody else. It would have no, to be I, something I, like I get it, and I I think the code generation is always interesting. Um, whether that can be maintained or not, if there is a tool that just worked, I'd love to use it. Um, but even at Microsoft, where I know there's teams that have done a lot of investment in it, it, it's like the starter, and then there's a lot of tweaking that goes on, and there's debates whether it's really worth it or not. Well, so, that, that's what you'd have to do, right? You, you, you test it on a language of choice in, your, in, in the repo, but the code is generated. You don't, you, don't, you don't manually tweak that stuff. You just tweak the ML okay. until it works. We're at that time again. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Vanessa, laughing and crying. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we didn't get to see Vanessa walking. I mean, we got the you know the, the walking and stationary spot. She ran oh, frantically all the way. I'm still walking. I'm just off camera today. Uh, ran what? frantically all the way as soon as we talked about Mono Repo. <laughs> Till next week. Till next week. Bye, guys. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye, Vanessa. Bye. Bye, Steve.